Anyone familiar with this channel will know that I've been kind of obsessed with the Resident Evil games ever since the first one kicked off survival horror on the PlayStation a quarter of a century ago. Yeah, I'm that fucking old. The series went through its ups and downs over the years as different trends and fashions came and went, and every new title tried to raise the bar for action, drama, and world-ending stakes in a kind of computerized dick-waving contest. It all got a bit out of hand by the time Resident Evil 6 came around Around, which threw so much over-the-top shit at you that it became the gaming equivalent of a Michael Bay movie edited by Zack Snyder. Resident Evil 7 represented a much more stripped-down, back-to-basics approach, prioritising atmosphere, carefully crafted tension and problem-solving over explosive action and spectacle. It was good fun, and while I had a few issues with the pacing towards the ends, overall I was pretty happy with the change of direction. It really felt like Resident Evil was back on track. So I was pretty pumped by the news that Resident Evil 8, codenamed Village, because it takes place in a village, was going to be hitting the shelves this year. In fact, I was so focused on not spoiling the experience that I basically stayed away from any reviews and online speculation so I could just play the damn thing for myself, form my own opinion, and use it to ruin the experience for you instead. <laughs> the game kicks off with an animated storybook intro that looks like it came straight out of a Tim Burton movie, and if that doesn't clue you into the style of gothic horror this game's going for, then you're probably a few boulders short of a Chris Redfield. We're then reintroduced to Ethan Winters, the protagonist of the previous game. It's been a few years since the events of Resident Evil 7, and Ethan and his wife Mia have made a new life for themselves in Eastern Europe. You remember Mia, don't you? They even have a baby, Rosemary. Not to be confused with Rosemary's baby, that's a whole different story. Anyway, before they can get drunk and have some awkward and predictable marital sex, suddenly an assault team led by Chris Fuck Boulders Redfield bursts in, kills Mia, kidnaps Rosemary and knocks Ethan unconscious. I say old boy, what the dickens is going on here? Some time later, Ethan wakes up in the wreckage of the truck that had been transporting him. His captors are dead and he seems to be stranded in the middle of nowhere. Stumbling through the snowy woodland at night, you soon chance upon a nearby settlement. Only, it doesn't take long to figure out that all is not well with this place. It's like a typical night out in Greenock, only the locals are more attractive. <laughs> After interacting with a few of the villagers, who all die in such stupid ways that it genuinely had me questioning how they even survived this long, you learn that your daughter's been kidnapped by a local religious cult, led by the mysterious Mother Miranda, who plans to sacrifice her in a ritual for... reasons. And she's backed up by a group of freaks that look like they just stumbled out of a nightclub in Aberdeen. I've dated worse, to be honest. The game throws lots of inexplicable shit at you in this first little segment, but once you break through into the village proper, it begins to settle into the familiar Resident Evil rhythm. You're stranded in a remote location with no chance of rescue, surrounded by lots of things that want to kill you. Your objective is to explore the village and surrounding area, gather supplies and weapons to defend yourself, search for clues and items to progress, and ultimately rescue your daughter and get the fuck out of there. Standing in your way are an army of mutated monsters, deadly traps, problems to solve, and the occasional boss battle to keep you on your toes. As the story progresses, you learn that your daughter's been divided up into pieces and stored in sealed containers. Uh, just go with it. Each container's in the possession of one of Miranda's followers, so you're gonna have to defeat them one after the other to get all the jars and restore her back to life. Naturally, each of them culminates in a boss battle that'll test you in different ways, whether it's taking on giant vampire ladies, solving puzzles while being chased by terrifying hallucinations, or... whatever the fuck this is supposed to be. And of course, it being Resident Evil, it all culminates in an epic set-piece battle with assault teams, choppers, giant mutated tentacles, and a big explosion that vaporises the whole area. Because every Resident Evil game needs a good explosion to cap things off. Village was always going to invite comparisons to previous Resident Evil titles, and I guess it doesn't take long to spot the Resident Evil 4 influences here. Both games are set in a remote European location, although I love how the Japanese idea of Eastern Europe is some kind of quasi-medieval society where nobody's even heard of phones, computers or radios. 
Both feature dilapidated rural villages, towering castles and aristocratic antagonists, and both have a heavy gothic horror tone. And damn, if nothing else, Village really goes all in with this shit. There's werewolves, vampires, underground torture chambers, magic, ancient rituals, and even creepy possessed dolls to fuck you up. If Resident Evil 7 was the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, then Village is more like Van Helsing, fantastical and slightly goofy rather than grounded and believable. It's an interesting change of tone to be sure, but it feels weirdly out of place in a series that was all about mutated bioweapons, shady corporations and science experiments gone wrong. The first hour or so is definitely a slog. You're bombarded with so much ridiculous shit that it soon starts to feel farcical rather than scary. I was laughing my ass off on my first playthrough. <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> And it doesn't help that the opening chapter is basically one long scripted sequence that you can only occasionally interact with. I mean, most of this stuff is eventually explained later in the game, but really it feels like more of a flimsy justification for shoving in a bunch of gothic horror elements rather than a clearly thought out piece of narrative development. First impressions really do count, and the first impression you get from Village isn't a great one. Still, once you soldier through the tedious intro, the game finally opens up and lets you do your own thing, and there's a real sense of enjoyment to be had from just exploring the environment and taking in all the little incidental details, slowly painting a picture of a terrorised community falling apart from the inside. The real meat of the campaign is finding the four pieces of your daughter and combining them together to progress into the end game, with the village acting as a kind of central hub from which you can access the other four stages. Probably my favourite section is Lady Demis. Probably my favourite section is Lady Demis. Probably my favourite section is Lady Demetresk's castle. It's a nice big interconnected area set across multiple levels, with gorgeous level design, a decent selection of puzzles and smaller objectives, and a slower pace that focuses more on exploration and problem solving. I was getting real Spencer Mansion vibes from the place, which is interesting when you discover later that the real Oswald Spencer spent time here as a young man before going off to found Umbrella. Like maybe his own mansion was influenced by this place or something. It's a shame the game sets the bar so high early on though, because the other areas never quite measure up to this one. Heisenberg's factory is the weakest of the bunch for me. It's this weird grungy industrial facility that feels really out of step with the rest of the game, and it culminates in a boss battle that's so ludicrous and over the top that it looks like a Transformers movie crossed with Fury Road. I did kinda like the creepy doll's house though. It's dark and ominous rather than action packed, and there's a section where you have to power up an elevator and escape while being chased by a giant mutant fetus. It's a nice little tension builder because you're unarmed and vulnerable at this point, so you have to learn to work quickly under pressure. The characters in this game are a real mixed bag. On the one hand, you've got awesome antagonists like Lady D, who's charismatic and interesting while still managing to present a real threat to your progress. It's just a shame the game doesn't make better use of her. The trailers implied that she was going to be the big antagonist at the centre of everything, but in reality, she's just a standard boss that you fight and kill in the first few hours. I get the impression that Capcom themselves didn't quite realise her potential until that first trailer popped and everyone went nuts over her for a couple of reasons. <laughs> but by then it was too late to change the structure of the game, so they were stuck with her. But what's especially annoying is that she's actually a much more interesting character than Miranda, who barely even shows up until the last 20 minutes. I never really got a strong sense of who Miranda was, her motivations were pretty weakly explored, and even her character design looks boring and generic. I don't know man, she's no Albert Wesker that's for sure. Ironically, one of the weakest aspects of the game's story is Ethan than himself, mostly because the writers can't seem to decide what they want him to be. Is he a faceless, voiceless Gordon Freeman that the player can imprint themselves onto, or a fleshed out character with his own motivation and personality? Is he a terrified civilian desperately trying to survive in a situation he absolutely isn't equipped to deal with, or a gun-toting badass that happily takes on terrifying monsters while tossing off glib one-liners like the love child of James Bond and Duke Nukem? Capcom don't seem to know, so instead they go for some weird, 
unhappy middle ground where they try to blend all these conflicting ideas together and the result is a character that's too subdued and generic to be much fun but too distinct to imprint your own identity onto. This is a real problem because the finale tries to frame his story as some kind of epic tragedy but when you don't know or care much about the man at the centre of it, well, it just comes across as a bit forced and melodramatic. Chris Redfield, on the other hand, is a beloved character with a history stretching all the way back to the first game. Killing off someone like him would be a truly ballsy move that would have made this game stand out as one of the landmark titles in the series. But as it is, it feels like more of a side story about a tertiary character given a chance to go on his own little adventure before handing the series back to someone far more competent. Speaking of Chris, the game actually portrays him as kind of an arsehole. The Mia that he apparently kills in the beginning is in fact Miranda in disguise, but Chris never bothers to tell Ethan this until late in the game, for no good reason. I mean, how did you think the guy was going to react to seeing his wife killed in front of his eyes? Just like the gothic setting and classic horror monsters, Capcom wanted a shocking intro that they could conveniently dial back later without stopping to consider the implications for Chris's character. Anyway, that's enough of me babbling about the plot and characters, how is this game to actually play? Well, for the most part, it's pretty fucking good actually. Environments are varied and interesting to explore, the pacing is great, combat is satisfying although not particularly challenging, and the overall look and feel of the game is excellent. The early Resident Evil games were smart enough to realise that the threat of attack was often just as unnerving as the combat itself. They knew when to dial back the action and let the player breathe before the next confrontation, and the longer those quiet sections stretched out, the more tense it became because you knew that sooner or later something was going to come at you and fuck up your day. It's a bit like having a night out in Kirkcaldy. You know you're going to get knifed sooner or later, it's just a question of how many beers you manage to get in first. Fortunately, Village remembers those lessons and applies them successfully here. There are decent stretches where you're exploring a new area, expecting an attack to come at you any second, only to find another ominously empty room waiting for you. The slower pace encourages a greater sense of exploration and heightens the immersion because you're actually allowed to stop for a while and absorb your environments. The problem is that the game suffers from the same problem as Resident Evil 7. As the action ramps up towards the finale, the carefully constructed tension starts to give way to big set-piece battles, and it all begins to feel a bit rushed and chaotic. At one point, you even play as Chris Redfield himself, leading a full-scale assault against the village, but you're so overpowered and overgunned by that point that it feels like you've gone from Resident Evil to Gears of War. The whole thing is also over so quickly that it kind of had me questioning why it was even included in a game that's focused almost entirely on Ethan. Just because you brought in Chris Redfield doesn't mean you have to turn it into Resident Evil 6 for fuck's sake. Weapons are your usual mix of Resident Evil favourites. You've got handguns for cheesing weaker enemies at longer range, shotguns for room clearance, and magnums and grenade launchers for the boss battles. They're all upgradable in various ways, and the game's smart enough to keep things simple and streamlined. Although I have to admit, I'm a bit perplexed by the sniper rifle in a game where most of the combat takes place in small rooms and narrow corridors. I mean, I held onto it all the way to the end, expecting some arbitrary sniper level to crop up at some point, but nope, it never happened, and the thing sat collecting dust in my inventory for the whole game. Fuck off, sniper rifle. You're not exactly drowning in variety when it comes to enemies either. You've got your basic werewolves that are easily handled one-on-one, -on -one, but can swarm you in larger numbers. Zombies that show up in one or two locations for a special guest appearance, and these weird mechanical arseholes in the factory that soak up bullets like six-foot sponges. And that's basically it, to be honest. Other Resident Evil games knew when to throw a new enemy type into the mix, forcing you to adjust your tactics and avoiding you settling into that tension-killing comfort zone of knowing how to handle every threat. Now it becomes just another reason why the later stages are such a breeze to get through. Much as I love it, the Resident Evil series was never exactly known for its inventive boss battles, and Village is no different. Most of them devolve into dodging enemy attacks until they expose their glowing red vulnerable spot, but some don't even bother with that, and it's more a case of unloading into them and hoping that they die before you run out of bullets. Another bone of contention for me is the inventory management, because there basically isn't any. 
The original games gave you pretty limited carry space, forcing you to make difficult choices about what you wanted to take with you, load up on weapons, ammo and healing items, and you'd stand a better chance in combat, but you'd struggle to carry the key items needed to progress, resulting in a slower and more frustrating experience. On the other hand, Travel in Light offered the flexibility to progress quickly, at the cost of leaving you vulnerable to enemy attacks. How you chose to tailor your loadout depended on how you wanted to approach the game, but the point is that one way or another, it was a decision you had to make. You always had to maintain that delicate balance of finite resources and carry space. Yeah, it wasn't perfect, but it offered a decent compromise between player convenience and the limitations of what a person could realistically carry. Now it's not even an issue. You've got enough space right off the bat to carry a hefty stockpile of weapons, ammo and health, meaning you rarely have to leave anything behind. And if that's not enough, you can even purchase extra space from the merchant. Key items don't even factor into the equation anymore. They're stored in a separate area with infinite space, so once again, it takes a cleverly balanced system that constantly challenges the player to be as efficient as possible and flushes it down the shitter. You're not exactly short on collectible resources either. Gone are the days when you'd be sneaking around with only half a clip to your name, having to carefully weigh up whether it was worth using your ammo to take down an enemy or try to sneak by and risk taking damage. Now you've got more than enough to comfortably gun down everything in your path, provided you don't aim like me after two pints of Jack Daniels. It all just feels a little too easy, like the game's afraid to challenge players too much or they'll get fed up and walk away. It's the same with the puzzles, which rarely hold you up for more than a couple of minutes and usually consist of nothing more complex than find a thing to use on another thing. Probably the most time consuming one you'll face is the doll's house, where you have to do some stuff to a mannequin to get a key and open a door, but even that's just a case of being methodical and searching the area carefully. Not exactly mind bending stuff, and once again, I can't shake the feeling that it was deliberately dumbed down to make the game as accessible as possible. Ultimately though, despite these gripes and reservations, Resident Evil Village was still a fun, interesting new addition to the Resident Evil franchise. It's not exactly groundbreaking in terms of design or game mechanics, but the atmospheric setting, gorgeous graphics and flamboyant antagonists were enough to keep me engaged to the ends. The campaign is a decent length, and there's enough hidden areas, bonus items and extra modes to keep you replaying for quite a while. I certainly enjoyed myself, and while a few niggling gameplay issues and a slightly disappointing finale prevented it becoming one of my all-time favourites, it's definitely a solid entry that I'd recommend to anyone looking to dip their toes into the world of Resident Evil. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.